Welcome to Significant Figures, Units, and Conversions, Part 2. So in the previous video, we went over how to determine how many significant figures a number has, how to do math with significant figures, how scientific notation works, and also accuracy, precision, and percent error. In this video, we are going to go over units, conversions, and how to do math with unit conversions. So to start, this table that I'm showing you is a list of SI units. And in science, we always like to use these units and not other ones. So SI stands for Système International. Okay, that was an awful pronunciation. It's French. But it's basically a standardized system that we all use. So we don't measure in science with inches. It's always centimeters. The US has yet to catch up and get into the metric system. But we are going to use mostly these and some other units and also the reason why it says SI base units is we can combine these units and make more complex units. So for example, density is grams per milliliter, or it can be expressed in other variations of those two things, but it's mass per volume. Or for example, many solutions in chemistry are described as moles, which is a measure of an amount of atoms per liter, which is a measure of volume. So then you start to have complex units. But don't worry too much about that. We'll cover that in a second. These are unit prefixes, and they help us when we have a measurement that's too big or too small for our base unit. So for example, take meter. A meter, we know how long that is. If I want to measure how big is my fingernail, is a meter a good measurement? Not really. I think I would rather measure that in centimeters. So a centimeter would be a hundredth of a meter, and the prefix centi tells us that. But it turns out there are a ton of other prefixes that we can use here. So uh, we have deci, which means one-tenth. We have deca, which means ten of it. We have milli, which means one-thousandth. We have micro, which means ten to the negative sixth. And now that scientific notation is starting to come back and haunt us, right? So when we get down to these really little prefixes that we might not hear a lot, like micro, nano, pico, femto, atto, Micro and nano are the heavy hitters in, in biology and chemistry and also sometimes in physics. So for example, I worked in a biochemistry lab. We measured everything in microliters. If you do problems with light and wavelength and frequency, it's all going to be in nanometers. So we use those a lot. Pico is used sometimes when we get down to the atomic level. Fento and addo, not so much. But if you are just learning about these prefixes, you're going to be tested on all of them. But the middle ones to a higher degree. On the larger end of things, mega and giga and tera are again, they're used often, maybe in like astronomy when you're going long distances or with mega, giga, terabytes. And then if we get into like peta and exa, you don't see those a lot outside of this unit. But for this unit, we like to memorize them. So for the middle ones, they go every place. So for example, we have like decimeter, centimeter, millimeter. And those all shift by just one decimal place because that's commonly when we use the unit. When we get into these strange and weird ones at the ends, we go by, by increments of 10 to the third power. So here we're going 10 to the third power. Or if we're going down the table, that would be multiplying by 10 to the negative 3. And here again by 10 to the negative 3. And here again by 10 to the negative 3. And here again by 10 to the negative 3. I like to remember micro. Micro is 10 to the negative 6. So actually this 10 to the negative 3 progression starts here at milli. And then I like to think that nano sounds like 9. So when we look at it, a nano something is 10 to the negative 9th of that thing. So there are 10 to the negative 9 meters in a nanometer. There are 10 to the positive 9 nanometers in a meter. And if you get confused on directions, like, okay, I know that the conversion factor for nano is 9, but if I'm equating to 1 meter, are there 10 to the positive 9 or 10 to the negative 9 nanometers? Oh, it's really small, so maybe it's negative. But the thing that I'm going to ask you is, are there lots of nanometers in a meter? Or are there lots of meters in a nanometer? And that's going to kind of direct you into what kind of number to use. For example, we know that 10 to the positive 9 nanometers is equal to 1 meter. And the reason we know that is because if we were to take a meter stick 
and we were to line up lots of little one nanometer objects along it, we would have lots of them. We would have one billion or 10 to the positive nine of those, not one billionth or 10 to the negative nine. But one billionth of a meter equals one nanometer. So hopefully I've gotten that point down. So if you have a table like that in your textbook or from your PowerPoint slides from your class, try to memorize it. So now we come to actually doing the math of unit conversions. And when we do this, we like to use fractions that equate to one. So for example, let's say I wanted to ask how many centimeters are in three meters. So for this problem, we want to go from centimeters, that's where we're starting, to meters, that's where we're going. So we want a conversion factor that can take us from centimeters to meters. If we look back at our handy dandy table, or hopefully maybe we know this, 100 centimeters fit in one meter, right? So for one meter, there are 100 centimeters. So when we are doing this conversion, if we have three meters, what I want to do is cross out this unit of meter and get the unit of centimeter in there. And units multiply in the same way that numbers multiply. So if you have a number on the top and the bottom, like five over five, it's just one because the fives cancel out. If you have meter over meter, they also cancel out. And remember when you have a number that does not have a fraction, that number is on the top of its fraction and it's got an invisible one beneath it, right? So we can multiply this by a fraction that has meters on the bottom and the purpose of that is so our meters can cross out with each other and centimeters on the top because then we end up with a number that is something centimeters. Now we talked about these numbers are going to be 100 centimeters and one meter because essentially those two things are the same. 100 centimeters equals one meter. So like if I have x equals y and I do x over y, that's the same as x over x is the same as x over y is the same as 1. So we are multiplying by 1 and we get 300 centimeters, right? So hopefully that makes sense in terms of how to do it. So let's try another practice problem. So let's ask ourselves how many kilograms are in... 5,000 micrograms, and this Greek letter mu stands for micro. So now we get a little bit more complicated because neither of these are our base unit. What I like to do when I have two units that are connected by the same base unit is I like to use a conversion factor where everything equals one unit. So like I want to get one gram in kilograms and one gram in micrograms, and those are equal to each other. So we are going from micrograms to kilograms. And I know it's the other way around in the question, so be careful. The root of the question that says what this or how many that, that's telling you where you're getting to. So we are starting with 5,000 micrograms, and we want a fraction that's going to cancel out micrograms. So we have micrograms on the top, we're going to put it on the bottom. And this is usually how things are going to work. The unit we want to cancel out, the unit we're coming from goes on the bottom. The unit we're going to goes on the top. So instead of asking myself how many kilograms are in one microgram or micrograms in one kilogram, remember I said let's figure out how many of each one is in one gram. So how many kilograms are in one gram? Well, there's a thousand grams in a kilogram. There's 10 to the third grams in a kilogram. So there are 10 to the negative third kilograms in a gram because if you try to fit one kilogram into one gram, it won't work. The kilogram is the bigger one. So only a fraction of the kilogram will fit in the gram. For micrograms, it's the other way around. If we are trying to figure out how many micrograms are in one gram, it's not going to be a fraction of microgram. It's going to be lots of micrograms. So remember, micro was the sixth power. So we're either doing 10 to the sixth or 10 to the negative sixth. Which one are we doing? We're doing 10 to the sixth. 1 million. So there are 1 million micrograms in 1 gram. So now we get a little bit of practice doing 
our conversions with scientific notation. So we're going to cross out our micrograms. Our final unit is kilogram. And then I'm going to really quick put 5,000 in scientific notation just to help us out. So 5,000 is 5 times 10 to the what? 10 to the third. And then we have times 10 to the negative third divided by 10 to the sixth. So this is now in kilograms. So remember that 5 times 10 to the third, even though it's not in a fraction, is on the top. So this is equal to 5 times 10 to the, and we're adding 3, and we're adding negative 3, and we're subtracting 6. So 5 times 10 to the negative 6. And that's how many kilograms we have. So hopefully now we know how to convert between units. And it's not just for prefixes. We could do centimeters to inches or inches to centimeters. And actually, I'm going to take the moment now to do an example of how many seconds are in one year. So this is going to require multiple conversions unless you can really do things in your head. So if we are asking how many seconds are in a year, then we're going to be starting with one year, right? Because that's the quantity that we have. And we don't know how many seconds it is. So our game plan can be going from year to day, because we know that, right? To hour to minute to second, right? So we're going to have to do lots of conversions, but we're going to see how they fit with each other. So if I do one year and I want to convert it to days, I'm going to multiply by a fraction that has years on the bottom and days on the top. So I want these two to be equal. So I know how many days are in one year, so I'm going to make this one, and this is 365. And those numbers are equal to each other. So we can do that fraction because we're essentially multiplying by one. We're not altering the thing of one year. We're just multiplying it by one to change its unit. So years cross out. And now we've got to get rid of days. So we're going to have a new fraction with day on the bottom. So we can cancel it out. And we're going to have hour on the top. So there are 24 hours in one day. So that's equal to one. And we're allowed to multiply by that fraction. So we're going to cross out day and day. And now we have to work with hour and minute. So we need hour on the bottom to cancel it out, minute on the top, in order to put it into our unit. And we're going to multiply by 60 minutes in one hour. So now our hours cancel out, and we're going to multiply by 60 seconds in one minute. Same protocol. And if we put together all these numbers, 1 times 365 times 24 times 60 times 60, I don't have my calculator anymore, or it's going to take too long to turn on. That is going to get us seconds, because we've canceled out all of our other units. Now, I want to get into how to, how to tell if you have an error. So let's say that I want to figure out how many, how many um, deciliters are in one liter, right? Pretty simple problem, but if I say I have one liter, which is my starting, and I want to get it into deciliters, let's say that I multiply by a fraction and I know that there are 10 deciliters in one liter, right? A deciliter is a tenth of a liter. There are 10 deciliters in one liter. What if I put the liter on the top? I say one liter and I say 10 deciliters because I forget which way it goes. How do I tell that this is incorrect? Well, I know that I get one tenth. And then how do we deal with the units? Well, we have liter on the top and liter on the top. Liter times liter is liter squared. So units work the same as numbers. X times X, X squared. Liter times liter, liter squared. And on the bottom, we have deciliter. Notice that nothing canceled out. And there is our problem. We should have flipped our fraction. We should have done one liter. Yeah, one liter, not deciliter. Times one or ten deciliters over one liter. And these liters now cancel out because liter divided by liter equals one.
right? And then we get 10 deciliters. So that's how to do how to do error checks in your unit conversions. So with all of this in mind, let's try an example problem. Let's try what is the mass of a 1.75 liter sample of a liquid that has a density of 0 0.921 grams per milliliter. Density is mass per volume, but even if we didn't know that, we can use the units in order to help us solve this problem. So I want mass. Where do I see mass? I see mass in the density because grams per milliliter. We just have to get rid of that stupid milliliter that's annoying us there. And then we would end up with grams if we could cancel out the milliliter. So where could I get another milliliter? I could get it from the 1.75 liters, but only if I made it into milliliters. Because we know how to do that, right? So we can take 1.75 liters and we can multiply it by a fraction that has got milliliters on the top and liters in the bottom. That way the liters cancel out. How many milliliters are in one liter? 1,000 or 10 to the third power. How do I know it's 10 to the third and not 10 to the negative third? Because there are lots of milliliters that fit in one liter. So I want that number to be really big, not really tiny. So now we have that and we get that it's 1.75 times 10 to the third milliliters. And we can then take this number and multiply it by our density of 0 0.921. And when we say grams per milliliter, the 0 0.921 is attached to the grams. It's on the top of the fraction. There is an imaginary one by the milliliter. There are 0 0.92 grams per one milliliter. There are 0 0.92 grams per milliliter. So whenever you see these units of like x per y, that's how it works. And we can, if we want, we can make it into a fraction with a bar and not with a slash, if that's going to help us conceptualize it better. So this milliliter is actually on the top, even though I wrote it beneath. And this milliliter is on the bottom. So then we end up with grams. And again, I'm not going to calculate it. But then you would get an answer and you'd be able to check it against A, B, C, and D here and see which one is correct. So we can do one more problem here. Let's try converting this. Now this is gonna teach us again that units work like numbers. So if I wanna cancel out x squared, I need to divide by x and divide again by x, right? I can't just divide once by x because there's two of them multiplied together. So in the same way, for centimeters squared to meters squared, we have to do the same thing. So. 1,285 centimeters squared. I don't know the conversion from centimeters squared to meters squared off the top of my head, but I do know centimeters to meters. So we're gonna do that. So centimeters, does it go on the top or the bottom? The bottom, because then they cancel out. And meters is going to go on the top. So how many centimeters are in a meter? 100 or 10 to the second power in one meter. Right? Now we're not done yet, because if we were to do this, we would cancel it out like this. And we would have meter times centimeter. But we want meter squared and no centimeters. So we're just going to do the same thing all over again. So now we have centimeters and centimeters crossing out. And we have meter times meter, which gets us meter squared. So then if we do this in our calculator, we can get an answer for that. And it's going to be like 0 0.1285, I believe. I just did that in my head, so I could be wrong. And that's meters squared. Often you're going to see cubic units, and that's for volume. Squared units are for area. And just whenever you see those, know that if you do a unit conversion from like something cubed to something cubed, you're going to have to do it three times. If you do a unit conversion, something squared to something squared, you're going to have to do it two times. So hopefully this helps you so that when we get to more complex units and problems that are new, we can use units as kind of a guide of how to tell what we're looking for, where we're coming from, and how to convert.